Hello and good evening, everybody. And uh, welcome to this, which is the launch event of the Community Tree Nursery Collaborative. And our first event is called From Seed to Seedling. And I'd like to welcome everybody here. We've had a fantastic response and it's great to uh, see so many people have joined the, the live session. Um, my name is Andy Egan and I'm one of the directors of the Fellowship of the Trees. And we have partnered with um, four community tree nurseries, Koidenvach, More Trees, Special Branch, and the Tree Musketeers um, to launch the Community Tree Nursery Collaborative. And I'll just say a few words um, about the collaborative before we get to the main part of the event, which is our fabulous speakers for this evening. Um, First off, we were encouraged by the success of initial online we, we event we held in July, which was called How to Set Up a Community Tree Nursery. And I know some of you um, who attended that have joined us again. So uh, fantastic to, to welcome you back. And uh, if, you, if you missed that event, it's on our YouTube channel, so you can uh, watch it there. Um, and... Um, this is first of four events that we're going to hold online. So there's going to be more events coming up every other month. So there's going to be another one in January, another one in March, and another one in May. Um, and we've also set up a Facebook group um, for the Community Tree Nursery Collaborative. And that's a space where community tree nurseries can share their stories, can ask questions, and exchange information. <laughs> so the collaborative has been set up as a peer-to-peer -peer learning network. And we see our role at Fellowship of the Trees as being to create and hold spaces that enable you to come together and to sort of learn and share the different journeys and the fantastic diversity of community tree nurseries around the UK. And we're obviously particularly keen to help support um, new and emerging tree nurseries. And the number of people who've signed up just shows the sort of amount of interest and I'm aware of um, how many new community tree nurseries are kind of emerging all, all around the country at the moment. Um, so we're really uh, keen to help um, community tree nurseries grow successfully. Um, we really want these, event, uh, these online sessions to be participative as much as possible. Um, so after the presentations um, from Marcelo and from Adam, um, we really encourage people to make their contributions, to, to ask questions. And when we come to the discussion, um, if you um, go to the reactions button, which is on the right hand side um, of the screen at the bottom, if you click on that, you'll be able to raise a hand, click on the raise hand. So when we come to that point, if you raise a hand, if you'd like to ask a question or like to contribute to the discussion, and uh, when you do, um, please introduce yourself briefly, your name, um, what uh, community tree nursery you're from, um, and what part of uh, the UK you're from. That would be fantastic um, as well. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just invite our speakers for this evening to begin their presentation. So I think Marcelo is going to speak first. Marcelo is from the Tree Musketeers um, in London, and then following that, Adam from More Trees in Devon um, is going to speak, and they're, they're giving us their insider's guide to uh, seed processing, stratification, germination, and propagation. So um, I invite Marcelo um, to present first. Over to you, Marcelo. Hi. Um... So, just a bit of background about the Tree Musketeers. Um, we mainly plant trees in parks in Hackney. So, our main aim is to have as big a diversity of species and almost mostly non-native species that we try and germinate. Um, this is the second year that we've been, that we've set up our own um, sort of, germination polytunnel to to grow on our own trees and really we only germinate about 200 trees a year um we're not looking at sort of quantity of 
because because we grow everything to be sort of semi standards um we're not looking at quantity of whips we're sort of looking at diversity and enough trees to um growing them that to that size takes up quite a lot of space so um instead of if we germinate too many we will run out of space in the nursery pretty much um when basically when me or any other volunteers go traveling we sort of collect seeds from different areas um recently obviously it's been harder to travel so i've been going to a lot of different parks and um places over over the uk and just collecting as many different varieties of trees tree seeds as possible um and if we could get the photos up um so i do try and um so this is sort of starting off the, uh, the first thing that we do before germinating seeds is pretty much um is sanitation in the nursery so we use a product to just clean all of our um, seed trays um, and sanitize them from the year before just to ensure that we're not spreading disease or any pests that could be soil borne in, in the seed trays. And it's just really important when you're reusing stuff like these plastic seed trays just to ensure that you're not harboring diseases in the nursery. Um, so the one that we use is called Fomes something can't it's got a really weird name but it basically means what we do is we just soak all of the trays for about 24 hours in this liquid and it it it's just it will kill any bacterias or viruses that are on on our trays um so then they're fresh and usable for the next season and then if we go to the next photo Tally. Okay, so when when select trying to select trees to collect seed from, I we try and collect them from as good a specimen as possible. So the next photo is actually one of the champion Crotagus um punk punk carters of the southeast. Um and if we get the photo, it would be amazing. It looks a bit of a mess. Sorry about that. It is. It's all right. Forgive uh, me, I, I'm not seeing any photos. Are you screen sharing? It's a technical difficulty, quickly. Sorry about that. But yeah, it's quite, it's important to get seed from good specimens of trees. So uh, if you ever go on the ancient tree inventory, or if you're a member of... Um, the, there's loads of other other places that you can actually find out where the champion trees are. What is it? The tree um, national tree inventory as well. And I just like not just going to see these trees, but collecting seed off them and growing from these select specimens that you know have good genetics. Um, so yeah. There is a lot of good. So recently I went up to Perth and in Perth, I saw the biggest Douglas fir tree I've ever seen in my life in um, Schoon Palace. And of course I couldn't help but collect seeds off that. And they were collected in like the 1600s or 1700s by, um, by the owner of that land, um, I can't remember what his name is right now, something Schoon, I think. Uh, no, Douglas, sorry, it was, his name was Douglas. So he, he, he collected Douglas furs and brought them to Scotland. And in um, Perth, it's called Big Tree Land because there are a lot of massive trees there that grow really well in those conditions. and collecting seeds from these select specimens are just just helps you know that you've got a good genetic diversity and um, instead of getting them from trees that have been produced mass produced in a nursery that could all be clones 
Um, so I try and collect as collect from quite old specimens and if possible from a champion tree just to um just to have that interest of sort of diversity and another things that you get when you collect these sort of when you grow from seed is you get diversity in in the, in your seeds in your in your saplings um so last year we we germinated some Malus Turingo and we germinated about five or six and one of them came out as a purple leafed variety by itself. Um, there is uh, a purple leaf variety in production commercially, but this would be a different genetic variation. So therefore would have having two different purple varieties is just increases genetic resilience and and just means that we're not using the same the same clones everywhere um, when we plant also i um i germinated some what is it fraxinus palisae which is a middle eastern ash and again germinated about about more of the, about 12 of these i think maybe and one of them has instead of having the classic um compound ash leaf it's got a single leaf just like a almost like a single leaf ash so i don't know if there is a named variety of this before but it could almost be a new variety that could be cloned and put into production um it could be fraxinus palisae um angustifolia or something um and it's just really interesting to have all of these differences when you grow from seed instead of just taking cuttings or um or or which would have clones which all have the same genetics basically how So yeah, that's the pots getting washed again. Well, basically, as as I try, as me and other volunteers from the Tree Musketeers travel around, we just we all just collect seeds um, from interesting trees and of interesting species that we can find on our travels we're also we've also just set up an account with defra with their peach system um i don't know if anyone knows about that it's to get phytosanitary um certificates to import seeds and i've we've been reaching out to other nurseries um around the world to sort of exchange seeds with them and and import them so there's a nursery in greece that i've been talking to that they only grow mediterranean oaks and so they're going to send us um some quercus pubensis quercus canariensis um i think quercus um, velutina and just all really interesting um species of oaks that would be a lot harder to come by here and the seeds would most likely be less viable when we if we collected them from the uk and it's just building these relationships to just try and have as diverse a species selection when we when we come to plant as possible really i think we germinated about 35 different species last year um so each of them, we only really try to grow less, like about 10, really. And therefore, um, we have a bigger diversity, but less individual trees. And yeah, so I had loads of photos of seeds that I'd collected, which was very interesting, and all the different shapes and sizes of them. Here you go. So if you go up that, if you go up to the last one, so that was the Critagus, um, 
and Kalata. They are, I think they were Asa Semperviruns. And then these little ones are the Malus Turingos. Um, and then the next Asa was um, Snake Bark Maple. Um, and as you can see, they're all, there's a massive variety in the seeds. Um, and yeah, after collecting them, there's a little Quercus rugosa that we germinated. So we only got, only got one of them, and that is a net leaf oak, which I was very, very proud of being able to germinate. And one day will look amazing in a park. And we'll, I don't even know if we have one in Hackney at all. So trying to get this diversity into our parks instead of just having native oaks that nowadays in the heat island effects really struggle in our in our parks in london um having more resilient oaks like um this and cork oak is one that we want to grow um quercus ilex as well um and then so here you can see the thing is quite a lot of these have quite bad germination rates um, so for example tulip tree we i got a whole like a big handful of seeds like this and put it all in a tray to germinate and only one one germinated but just one is almost good enough um if we could grow one a year would be great if it was three even better but just they have a really low germination rate so sometimes it's almost like a shotgun effect where in in one pot i will put four seeds and if they if it germinates in one season then great and if we get one out of those four then great we're not really looking for all of them to germinate because we cannot we can't even care for all of them when they've come to germinate and then if you go to number photo number 10 you can sort of see what it's like collecting having all these different species and then like you can see on the left there's one that there's some seeds that are soaking that i've left to soak overnight um so that they've so that they're ready to sow and basically each of these species requires different treatment in order to germinate um they like the more mediterranean species i've almost realized that it's better to to store them dry and then um and then sow them in spring or for example the the mediterranean oaks when i put them in the soil like you would a normal oak they just they just rotted they went they all went bad and I've almost realized that you, all you need to do is put them on top of the soil because they're not used to our rich soils. They're used to germinating in like really poor, arid environments that, that the, I don't know, just this is the second year that we've been experimenting with all these sort of exotics. And we've, we've had a lot of failure, but we've also had a lot of success. And all of the failure is, is learning. But for each of these jars, basically, I go on the internet and I will Google all as, and find as many different recommendations on how to germinate them as possible. And then sometimes try a few different methods. So different soils, um, covering them with different stuff. Sometimes I quite often just have composts um, and then put the seeds on top of the compost and then cover the top with vermiculite um, instead of covering it with compost just to allow the light to pass through. So, for example, we germinated um, a lot of um, what they called foxglove trees, and they're really, really tiny seeds that can almost like would almost fly away if you blew, blew them. And they need light to germinate. They, if you if you bury them, they won't germinate. So, to make sure that they don't blow away, covering them with a thin layer of vermiculite just help just helps keep them 
in contact with the moisture of the soil and means that they don't blow away. Um, and then if you go to the next photo, you can see where on the plate, like, what are these? These were um, hop hornbeam. So I had a whole bunch of hop hornbeam seeds and you can see the little bits, the little round bits on the plate are each one that have been extracted from the sort of cone or the, the, um, the seed pod. And this is quite often, takes quite a while just individually extracting all the seeds, ensuring that they're dry. And then if you go to the next photo, once they are dry, except except for like the nuts and other species that you want to soak fresh, um, certain species that I want to keep dry or store them dry over winter, I just put them in envelopes and all the envelopes fit nicely in my in this little plastic box that I've got. And then some of them I put in um, mesh bags, and this is just so that they're not just to keep them dry and to sure ensure they don't go mouldy over winter. Um, and also some of them can so for example like laburnum laburnum is a species that the seed can be viable up to 30 years so if there's a good if i find a really nice laburnum tree that i want to collect seed from i will collect a lot and that's potentially 10 20 years of seed that i have that i have and can use and then i don't need to go out collecting laburnum every single year um and if you go to the next photos, you can see some of the successes that we had. So Quercus cerus. Um, I think the next one's ginkgo. The ginkgo, I almost gave up on, to be honest. Um, I collected them from quite an old tree and put them in, put them in root trainers, just in compost, um, extracting them from this, from the, from the, it's it's not it looks like a fruit but it's not a fruit but extracting the fruit from was horrible because it's literally smells like vomit if anyone has ever handled them they would they will know about it um but again i almost gave up on them and then there was one week this summer that was like every day above 20 degrees um and none of them had germinated until that one week that they had a consistent um consistent temperature above 20 degrees and then about 80 percent of the seeds that i collected germinated and i and about a week or two before that i almost gave up on them so when dealing with some of these sort of fiddly species it is about not giving up um you won't always get good success and they their germination rates can be really erratic and some even take two years to germinate, like some of the Acer species. They require a, a heat treatment, then a cold treatment, then a heat treatment, then a cold treatment to germinate. Um, so it is all a bit of an experiment and we're learning as we go. As I said, this is like the second year that we're trying to germinate as many of these exotic species as possible. But it's really interesting and really rewarding to see all of these species come through. So, like, what's the next one they had? Pinus with China, which one day will look amazing. I love how they have the soft needles on them, and almost minor. Again, this is a, this is meant to be a tree that has quite a low germination rate. But this spring, again, I collected like a big handful and put it all in a tray expecting to only get a few trees and then i don't know i think i got about 60 70 per tray um and so now i've been trying to offer these out to other nurseries because it's way more than we can we can like take care of really but some years you will get mast years in your area where the seed is particularly viable and those are the years that you want to really take advantage of those particular species so don't know if anyone has realized but this year has been really bad for oak um the only oaks that i've seen that have had seed on them were um quercus ilex in the uk um and basically i just was like i just 
gave up. I was like, I'm not even going to try and germinate any oaks this year. There's a lot of other species that that are out there to germinate. And then the next is the is stone pine. Um, this was really hard to germinate because a lot of them germinated, but because again they're med a Mediterranean species, they and because we're a community nursery and having all of the sort of all of the trees next to each other, regardless of where they're from, the first lot that germinated were kept too wet and rotted off almost immediately straight away. Um, so we only got a few that managed to to actually survive till um, survive the year, um, and it's been it's kind of difficult to manage having all of these trees that require different requirements and different treatments all in the same space that are managed by volunteers because um, when, you, when you say, oh, can you water the, the seed, the propagation tunnel, people it will just water everything equally and I've had to make separate areas for like, needs a lot of water, needs a normal amount of water needs very little water. Um, so what I realized is the the pine, the stone pines, I would only water them on hot days where the soil would dry out by the end of the day. If the soil was allowed to hold moisture for two or three days, they would just they would just rot off immediately. Um, and all of these things that we, all of these failures are almost lessons that we've, that we've learned and have, are improving everything that we're doing. Um, so the next one that we, next success was the Rabinia. They germinate quite easily, but a lot of them got eaten up by slugs. So before, before all of them did, we had to like move them aside and keep them keep them protected almost um so there's not just the management of the the watering and treatment of all these different seeds but each is susceptible to different pests um and that also needs to be managed we started putting like little covers on them so that the slugs couldn't get in and it's only for the first sort of um the first few leaves that they're really susceptible once their leaves harden off they're not so bad and then um it was a fig as well that we germinated again doesn't like sitting in water um so yeah again it doesn't like sitting in water so it just needed um to be divided up into sort of different types of care um and same with the with the quercus ilex they really don't like sitting in the water as well so having different ways of managing them was quite difficult but over time we've been getting better at it and um it's it's improved a lot really and then i was gonna there's a little video of our sort of propagation tunnel yeah, so what we, we've done is um we've made a bench and put misters over it so that I can we and it's on a timer so we can change how many times a day and for how long the mister will mist for. Um, but then also crucially we built a little cage to protect all the seeds from squirrels, particularly the nuts, um, acorns and all of all of those types because otherwise squirrels will get in there and just raid them there's like a particular period of time in in autumn where they're just looking for anything and they will just go for anything um so yeah here it is So yeah, that's our that's our propagation bench, and that's where we put all the seeds on on the bench there to stratify over winter. Sometimes I stratify them in the fridge, um, but I prefer 
just putting them out in trays because what will jump it's it's a lot less effort for others to have um to just do one one sewing and then leave them all out over winter instead of have to bag them up and then keep checking them see if any germinate um and then in spring so again i do experiment with a few of them trying to keep them in the fridge um in in like a mixture of perlite and compost but um it i find it i just as a community nursery we just don't always have time to keep on top of all these things so taking out all as many steps as possible to try and reduce the workload is just really useful um and it probably means we get less success in terms of individual germination rates but again as i said we're not looking to germinate 50 100 of each species we're not looking for every single seed to germinate we're just looking for to to grow a decent amount of each species um that we can have a variety instead of and again sometimes they they don't come up and we just have to learn, live with that and learn from that but the more we experiment the more we'll learn and the more different species we'll we'll have in our repertoire to be able to to germinate them so you can see like oak or trees with quite a big tap root we'll use um the root trainers and some if you go to the last first two i think we use air pots a lot actually if you go to number 20 you can see here sideways unfortunately but here these are the little um cells where each we have some individual trees germinated and basically once they've so this is in the spring once they've germinated and filled those cells and they will be watered all by the misters so it's as little work as possible in terms of watering and maintenance um and once they're they filled out their pot their little cell will then repot them into probably three to five liter pots depending on the species and then from then we'll harden them off um so if you go to the next photo so yeah we'll harden them off and then move them outside um slowly and as you can so we use air pots quite a lot just because it means we don't have to repot our trees that often and it helps give us a really dense fibrous root system and again we've put this sort of mesh so in this in these are um behind you can see Indian chestnuts that we've germinated, then we've got any leaves on it yet anymore. You see the one at the far right at the back does. So they we then we germinated last year and we put them straight into these five litre um air pots because again it's another less less work for us to do. So it, it's immediately in its first pot that it could live for two, three years in that pot. Um, so we would sow them in the pot and then we've built these sort of cages to put on top just so that the squirrels don't get in um and then once they start to germinate in spring then we'll take the cages off and then water them by hand and again it's just taking out all these little steps extra steps to mean to make sure that we that we manage to keep on top of it because it's almost worse having a seedling that has become root bound in a tiny pot because you haven't been able to repot it in time, then having these seeds in, a, in it's almost like, we'll repot this twice in its life maybe. We'll go from this, um, this five liter air pot to probably a 35 liter air pot. So it, it just means that's only one repotting instead of, having to go having to put it from root trainer into a air pot into a larger air pot and that's just because because we're working with volunteers we don't always have the time or when we do have the time it's there's a lot to do <laughs> so having as few steps as possible 
just makes our lives easier and it means that we get better quality trees instead of them getting root bound in little pots then causing problems for them in the future with root girdling and stuff like that so these are almost as the the roots almost spread as naturally as possible because they're in these air pots um, instead of circling around a, a traditional pot um, and if you go to the last photo, this was uh, these were the um, foxglove trees that were germinated, the uh, Polonia, and these germinate. These had a really good success rate. Again, I had a tray that had individual cells, and I basically just scattered hundreds of seeds over them. This is the first time I've ever ever germinated them. Scattered hundreds of seeds over them over the soil, put a layer of vermiculite. And in each cell, probably about five, six, seven trees grew. And so in a whole tray, I probably had 200 seeds almost. And we have no need for these, all of those 200 seeds. So from each cell, I just, we, I just selected out the one largest, most dominant um, seedling and then allowed that to, to grow on and therefore having the sort of what you would hope to be the best genetics, the sort of first germination, first to germinate, the quickest to grow and the strongest um, seedling. And any, any seedlings that almost don't, don't perform, if we have enough of that species, I almost prefer to lose that one seedling than to spend time nurturing it and and all and the soil and everything when potentially it's not going to be a vigorous growing tree when we get to it and and potentially so we try and select the best um of the saplings obviously some species we get a, a lot less germination so therefore that one that one or two saplings that we have are really precious and we almost try and over care for them, um, which also can be a problem with over caring and over watering. It's sort of a fine line with seeds like this, either they get a bit neglected and suffer a little bit, or even with a bit too much love, they can suffer a bit. So it's really hard to find that middle ground, especially when you have so many different species in sort of one polytunnel. Um, and then, yeah, so then from here, we'll then again put them into large air pots and these are really fast growing trees. So again, we'll probably wait for them to be 30 centimeters in these little pots, 20, 30 centimeters, and then try. we'll probably repot them into their final pot till they grow to about two meters and then plant them out um so it's it's sort of you have what we try and do is we can we only have so much time um we're not a commercial nursery like barchams or anything that can do everything to the letter and have really good germination rates and all of this so it's it's more about it's almost like cutting corners to to save your save time and be more efficient um which sort of does work in a way for us really and yeah that's that was that's everything that i've got for how we germinate seeds thank you marcelo thank you so much for sharing that uh, just a quick question for, how, how long have you been involved with the three musketeers uh maybe coming up to five years now but it's been it's over 20 years old now the charity that yeah yeah but you've learned so much in that time that is a real message i <laughs> i took from your your journey with the three musketeers well i just love to be able to experiment because so i'm training as an arb and quite often it's a lot quite a bit theoretical and you don't always get to apply it um so having somewhere to apply it is just really useful for me 
and actually experimenting with um with all these species and and just being with trees as much as possible really yeah that's that's great thank you thank you so much Marcelo I'm sure people have questions but we're first going to go to uh Adam now who's going to give us a a different perspective from uh uh from from the city of London to uh off off we're going off to Devon now to hear about uh his guide to uh propagation in uh in with more trees so over to you Adam You're on mute, by the way. So. Schoolboy error. There we go. My apologies. Um, yeah, Adam, director of More Trees, been with them about four years. Uh, the charity has been going 21 years. And we focus on growing native broadleaf trees in, uh, in, in Devon. So those trees, uh, the seeds from those trees are coming from woodlands uh, around Dartmoor and South Devon, woodlands and hedgerows. And then we grow them up and then we work with landowners and plant them back out locally to establish more woodland and, and new hedgerow. And interesting looking at Marcello's stuff and I had the privilege to go up to London and, and Marcello took me around there back in October. And it's a very different world that Marcello occupies working with a lot of these exotic trees. There are a lot of parallels and a lot of similarities, but um, really interesting to see and hear what Martello is saying about those, particularly those Mediterranean trees and having to keep those seeds very dry. Um, whereas where we're working with trees from Dartmoor, one of the wettest places in the country. And, uh, and we obviously have to have a different approach with regards to those seeds. So we'll do a flyby. And if Tally, you can bring up the slides. So if there's, if there's an issue, I can always share as well. Just a second. Okay. There we go. Okay. So yeah, that's us. Look out for us. Find us on online. That's that's my little plug there. But um, if we go on to the next slide, so seed collecting for us is very much a community affair. And we work with people of all ages locally to go out seed collecting or volunteering across three days a week. And September, October, early November is generally the time when we're out there. And these uh, next few slides show you just, yeah, it is a very physical, um, well, I say physical, it's not a difficult activity, but you are getting out there getting hands on with the trees you're physically picking those seeds from the trees and collecting them and um, scurrying around on your knees for the acorns when they're there um, and obviously it's a very exciting time for everybody and that's not an angry farmer in the background that was one of our members of staff there just creeping up on Lara but we we collect loads and that's that's the point really here in, and exactly what Marcello was saying you have to get a lot of seed just to get a few trees. Um, and the germination rates of trees vary considerably between species. And they also vary considerably within species from year to year. And don't be disappointed, you know, if you do put a lot of effort in and you don't get many trees, but equally it is a numbers game. So if you can, if you can collect a lot, then great. And some years it, it is boom or bust, obviously this year, I think we've collected about nine acorns. Um, and then in, in, a, in a few more slides, um, you'll see where we, we've collected a lot more than that in the past. But on this slide, we've got crab apple, we've got uh, sloes or blackthorn, you see we've got hawthorn and we've got rowan. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we also have in this one, a lot of field maple, um, we've got some hazel, we've got some elder, so we, we're collecting all the typically native broadleaf trees that we will find in our location. This was last year, not this year. That gives you an idea of like acorns and just how many we, we go out and collect. 
people talk about collecting the applique, collecting in different vessels. You know, some people say you shouldn't put them in plastic bags because they sweat. So if we hold on that slide for us, much I think, uh, not much else, sorry, Tally. Um, some people say, you know, don't collect in plastic bags because they because they sweat, you know, it should be in paper or, you know, mesh bags. Or We use buckets and we also use plastic bags. The point is not to then keep them in those plastic bags, but on the day of collecting them, you're going to be absolutely fine. Now, your acorns, we found that if you collect them when they've gone brown and you collect them when they're on the floor, then actually you get uh, much better viability. You know, they're much more likely to germinate within, within that season. Um, we can go to the next slide now. And in collecting oaks, if you can get them like this, that's perfect. If you get them like in the previous slide, what you can do is just put them in a bucket and mix it in with a load of leaf mulch and just let it rest. And just occasionally just, um, you know, just move them around, make sure that they, you know, air does also get into them so, they, so they're not getting mold on them. But as soon as they start to crack, and as soon as they put out this radical, you know, it looks a bit like a taproot, then that is the time that we want to start planting them. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, that is obviously two extremes, you know, and uh, they were both exceptionally viable uh, uh, and will both grow into, grow into healthy oak trees. But this shows you that with the acorn particularly, with that, with that fruit, um, with that seed, sorry, it wants to grow. So if you can get it at this stage, you know that you've got a tree that wants to grow. So many of our seeds, it's a much harder to tell whether or not that the seed is gonna be viable. Acorns, they're great. They show you straight away. So this, these have been picked up. As I say, we've scrabbled around leaf mold, probably around October. You'll see all the acorns on the trees. You'll see when they start to fall and that's the time to go and grab your acorns. When it comes to planting them, if we go to the next slide, we um, learned the hard way. So we prepared a bed, you know, we double dug it, turned it over, made all the soil fluffy, great, great soil, drilled lots of holes, put lots of acorns in, felt very satisfied that even we had a measuring stick. So they're all 10 centimeters apart, each one, beautiful day's work. Came back the following week, most of them are gone because the squirrels had got in there. And they, for them, it was just like a picnic table. So, we now don't grow our acorns directly. Um, we, we don't sow directly into the earth because you're just in direct competition with the squirrels and they're, 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 they're far, far more efficient at finding them than we are. So if we go to the next slide. So we use root trainers. Some of you may be familiar with root trainers. Um, they're basically reusable plant pots. Um, but what they do is, if we go to the next slide, you fold them up and then you insert them into this, what I call a bread tray. And, uh, and, and with, with that, you then can directly sow into these. So if we go to the next slide, we've filled these up with a compost medium, and then all of those acorns, which were putting out that little radical, we've just popped them on the top. And then on top of that, we put some leaf mold. In the next slide, you'll see where we put some leaf mold and just scatter that over the top. Um, and this for us is just, doing a copycat really what's happening on the forest floor but then the most important thing following on from that is the sky uh, building these big cages so what we've done is we've because we want to do big enough big numbers um, and we are looking within the next 18 months to have 50,000 trees growing at any one time across both tree nurseries and we also want 25 of those to be ready every year to go out and plant woodland locally. So we've built these frames. So we don't want the root trainers on the ground. We want them off the ground. And that's because if they're on the ground, then um, a, a, you know, direct contact with the soil, the root trainers don't work because the idea of the root trainer is that once the roots come down and are, are, are guided downwards by those grooves within the root trainer, when the roots come out the bottom, they're air pruned. And if you put them in direct contact with the soil, the roots will just keep going into the earth. Um, and your oak, oak tree will be growing in the earth, as it were, but with the pot above it. So we've built these frames to keep them above ground. Also, it's a good ergonomic work height for us in terms of weeding and watering and so forth. 
And if we go to the next slide, we've built these cages around them. And these are massive fortifications, really. It looks outrageous, but this is simply to stop the squirrels. Because even though you've got them in root trainers and not in the soil, um, if, you, if you don't cage over them, the squirrels will just still go in and just pick them all out. Also being off the ground means the voles can't get them. So these are up on scaffold poles, as you can see. And um, up until now, voles haven't evolved to be able to climb up the scaffold poles. But what we do have done in the past is we've put them up on tables with wooden legs and the voles are clearly, the, the claws were like crampons and ice climbers and they just rattled up these and we were in on the top of the table and again, stripping out the acorns. So it looks um, a lot to do, and I wouldn't say this is for ev everybody. Um, there are simple, simple ways in which you can cage things uh, and still protect them from the squirrels, but this is because we're doing it at scale. If we go to the next slide. And you can see here, just in terms of our production, um, what we've done, we've got a large grant this year as well from the Green Recovery Challenge Fund, which has meant we've been able to do this, which is fantastic. We can also, by using root trainers, means that whilst we have very uniform growing, what we can also do is it makes it easy to access them, it makes it easy to water them, and uh, it makes it easy to health check them, makes it easy to count them, but very simply for us, it's a space issue as well. So we owe, we're only renting a, a small amount of land, and where we grow trees in an open bed, we may get 250 trees in a bed that's say five meters long, or one meter wide, but in that space, we can get a thousand root trainers. So it's simply a numbers game as well. There's also things to consider around biosecurity. So if we're growing some in the bare earth, as in bare root, and then we're growing some in tree cells in compost, if we had a poor compost mix, which has some toxins in it, we could potentially lose all these trees in our root trainers. But equally, we've still got trees that we've grown in the ground, uh, which would be there for the next year and vice versa. Uh, next slide. Hazel, again, this is this one is probably one of our hardest trees to grow, and that is not so much the hazels, that again is because of predation. To get to the hazelnuts before the squirrels is really, really, really tough. So if you do have a good source of hazelnuts, then that's fantastic. Um, so again, we collect them like this, and then next slide. What we do is we just simply peel the bracts off them. So with the acorns, there's very little preparation. With these, we just want to get to the nut. And then we also do a float test with our hazelnuts. And that means you throw them all in the bucket of water. And the ones that sink, chances are they've got a nut in them, a seed in them. So this, again, is one of the things with seeds and their viability. They look from the outside like they're good, good to go. But then once you, once you actually um, get inside it, you may find there isn't a viable seed. Beech this year, there's a huge amount of beech um, seed that we found, but you know, hardly any of them actually had a seed inside what the shell that you normally see. So you've got the outside, which is the spiky bit, and then you've got the inside bit, which is the sort of uh, four-sided pyramidal seed, uh, but actually that's not the seed, that's like a husk, and then inside that's the actual seed. So um, inside was very, very little. So once we've taken all the bracts off these, next slide, please. This is what we used to do. So, uh, and we still, we still use old bats and they show these because this is how we started out. We would sow directly into, into bathtubs. And this is what we call our stratification. So there's two methods of stratification. There's an artificial method, um, again, which I'll show you in a bit, where we take the seeds directly and we mix them into a coir mix and then add a bit of moisture and then stick them in the fridge for a period of time. And that period of time depends on the species. Or we do it like outside and just again, emulate nature. So these are filled with the compost soil medium. And then we um, layer in seed, put some soil on top, layer in seed, put some soil on top. We could put 5,000 hazelnuts into a single bathtub, same with acorns. Guard it again, because we want to keep the squirrels out of it. Um, and then we wait and see what comes up. Doing it like this is much less labor intensive than if you imagine putting a single hazelnut into every single root trainer and you just, you don't know what you're gonna get. Um, so by doing it this way, if you can very quickly sow them in effect 
and then just let nature take course. And you get some coming in the next spring, but just wait because again, the following spring, so they've gone through, you know, a whole winter, a whole year, they may, others may come up as well. So you can, you can then prick them out and take them on from there. Next slide, please. So because again, we wanted to expand, we wanted to have more stratification and we couldn't get enough bathtubs. So what we, um, what we did is purchase these. So these are low beef cattle troughs and we've just repurposed them. So the, these are feed troughs for cattle, which we've then just taken and we use them exactly the same as a bathtub. And again, if um, we will do with seeds to, to, to two or three different varieties. So we'll put seeds in into these. We might put seeds into these in a drier compost mix. We might put them into a wetter mix. We also may put some directly, in, as I said, into our fridges as well. So we're just hedging our bets, basically, try and maximize germination rates. The other thing is when you stratify things outside, it may take two seasons for them to get going. Whereas the whole purpose of us breaking down the husk and the shell and obtaining the seeds and then putting that seed into the car and into the fridge is to speed up that stratification process, artificially speed it up so things can germinate quicker and we know we will have trees growing the following year. Yep, if you can move on. Thanks, Abby. So whilst we've put, once we've put things into our stratification troughs, we're once again guarding them. As I say, particularly hazelnuts, uh, beech nuts, acorns. But we also shade them because when they're sat in there, it, they can get hot, um, too hot and the soil can dry and there's a lot of evaporation coming off that soil. So by doing shading like this, it reduces the amount that we need to water. Thank you. Now these, um, we, we've just built these this year. So the point of this is that when things are growing up, if we just have that flat cage on them, they're gonna be suppressed. So as soon as they grow to be two, three centimeters high, they're gonna be pushing against the cage. So this is another way for us just to keep them in there and pop this on the top so they've got some room to grow. With hazelnuts and with oak, um, sorry, if you just go back one, with hazelnuts and with oak, what we've found is even though the tree's a year old and it might be 20 centimeters high to a squirrel or a vole, that nut is still food. So they will still come and dig it up and take the nut. So you've gone to all that effort of getting your tree to grow. And even though it's a year old and it's looking beautiful, it could still be taken. And, uh, and so this is why, why we've um, been pretty hot on guarding. Okay. So that's the nuts, if we've talk, talked about there. So fleshy fruit now. So these are hawthorn, or berries, but these are, um, have a stone inside them. So these are very similar to blackthorn, very similar to wild cherry, for example. And uh, for us, <coughs> we just, <coughs> pardon me, we just squash these and we remove we the stone, wash it to make sure there's no fleshy material on it, which could then obviously start to, um, as it decays, get mold on it, which could then compromise, compromise the actual seeds that's inside that stone. Um, if we go on to the next slide. So once we've collected, if you imagine, um, this won't be very hard, but you imagine we go out and collect it when it's been pouring with rain. The point is, is we have loads of seeds that are very wet. And if we just keep all those in that bucket together very quickly, they'll get moldy and mashy. Uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, rot away. So what we do here is we've just, we've just laid them all out um, just, to, just to dry them out before we have time to process them because we're collecting hundreds of thousands of seeds. We worked out this year, um, excluding birch, because obviously you can't count birch seeds really. You, you, get, you get so many, we collect about half a million. So it's pheno phenomenal numbers that uh, you collect, but you think that we're looking to probably only get out of that maybe about 30, 40,000 trees, gives you an idea of the numbers game that you're playing. Um, so many of these won't ever come to anything or a lot of them will be like runts. So when they grow, so you, you do have to have a coal system. You can't be too particular and put too much of your energy into, into a tiny tree if you're trying to grow quite a lot. The next slide. 
So that's, uh, that's not me making lunch for volunteers, you'll be very pleased to know. And what that is, is where we have processed, we've tried different types of fast processing, fleshy fruits like rowan. Rowan berries, everybody, every single one of our volunteers will tell you they're the most time consuming and hardest thing to process if you want to get the tiny seeds out. Inside a rowan berry, there could be five or six seeds and you would easily fit those on your little fingernail. They're quite small. Um, and so we've tried different ways. This is very simply, we've got a potato masher, some water, and we just mash in the seed pulp. And then what we do is we'll rinse that through a sieve and then, um, and then we'll try and find the seeds. And we thought that doing that, like massively pulping it, uh, would be a fast way of processing it. If we go to the next slide, this was um, us doing, this looks like Hawthorne. Again, the same principle, mashing it with, you know, pestle and mortar style. Um, it, and, 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 and again, if we stay on this slide, this year, what we've been trying, no, sorry, the one you just showed there, thank you. We found actually um, with Rowan, this was sort of a, a simple way, it looks ridiculous, but this was a simple way of doing it. That's simply just a piece uh, of um, flagstone and we just got the seed and we're just rubbing it with our finger. And we found very quickly actually doing this, we could get the seeds out faster than doing all, all of that mashing. So if we go to the next slide, You'll see, there you go. So that's the seed right on the fingertip there. And then what we do is the next slide, we just simply pop it into a mug of water. And then you just keep doing that, rubbing and grating. We've now upped our game on this. So we've got, um, no, go back one, sorry, Telly. So you, uh, what we've done is um, the mesh netting that you saw over things, we've basically stapled that down onto a piece of timber. And then we've also made a little block, exactly the same, and using them like, like a grater. We're just very rapidly grating them across these two bits of netting and then rinsing it off to get the seeds and then picking the seeds out again, putting them into a mug of water, and that's just keeping them safe. And then what we do is we drain those seeds, dry them out on some, uh, some blotting paper, you know, something like kitchen roll or uh, something similar. Uh, and then, then we have those seeds. So we can go to the next slide. This is possibly what I think one of the most beautiful seeds that we have of our native trees. This is spindle, Euronymus europaeus, absolutely gorgeous. Um, but once again, that is not the seed. That is what we pick off the tree. And then if we go to the next slide, you open it up and inside it, you will find these yellow seeds. And you can sometimes have two, three, four inside one of those husks that we just looked at. Uh, and then again, <clears throat> that yellow bit that's around it, that's like a little shell. So you can rub that off and finally you will get to, to the seed. Uh, so that's what we do when we're processing that right through, going right through that process. Apples, um, there's different ways of dealing with apples. The way that we've done it historically, and that's what these next two slides show, is physically chopping them. But the important thing is not to chop all the way through the apple with a sharp knife because you can actually end up chopping through quite a number of your seeds. Best thing is just almost like to score it all the way around and then break the apple open and then get the seeds out. And therefore you've got your Malus sylvestris, your, you know, your, your apple seeds there. Um, apple seeds, we know they can germinate quite quickly. Um, we've seen, you, you've seen them start and sprout sometimes even inside the apple. Older, we just collect the older dry and we'll find that the seeds fall out of the cones. Um, birch, which you won't see, I don't have an image, but again, you're familiar with that catkin of the birch. Again, going out on a dry day and just, if you remember as a kid, you might have stripped the seeds off a, off a piece of grass. It's exactly the same thing. You just drag your nail along those catkins and you will very rapidly collect millions and millions of birch seeds. So. <coughs> then we um trying to think where the next slide is actually Tom Ed. Oh, older, just so I'm showing you some nice older there. There we go. Um field maple again, field maple, hornbeam species like that. You find them and you've got the winged fruit, but actually, you know, that's his dispersal mechanism. Is that is that is that helicopter there? But what you'll find inside that is the actual seed, and you'll find a lot of these are empty. 
So if you give them a squeeze, you, might, you collect load, but actually you're processing, if you give them a squeeze, you'll soon find whether or not there's potential seed inside one of those. But we don't take the seed out of these. We just actually direct sow these. So, you know, I was talking about stratification in those big, large um, stratification troughs. Again, we will just scatter these in, thousands and thousands and thousands of them in there um, and see what comes up. Okay, next slide. Elderberry, again, very similar. Seeds in here are tiny. So this we actually do more as a mulch, as a paste. So we just squish them all down and then, <coughs> and then we just work with that. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide. And uh, holly, again, holly is really hard. We find the germination and propagation of holly really difficult. And actually what we're looking at is um, trialing holly cuttings or equally one thing that holly is really, really good at. <clears throat> you go to a woodland, you'll see there's a lot of tiny little holly trees that are doing, they're all just coming up. Um, and with landowner's permission is actually physically harvesting them at that stage but you can't let that root system dry out. You know, they need to be processed quite quickly. So if you do lift them up, you put them on a bucket with a leaf mold, can't let them dry out. And then you've got to definitely get individual ones grown, grown in pots. And holly is one of the ones we found that doesn't like growing in the bare earth, doesn't like growing in a big bed. It's, um, it's clearly a very selfish tree and likes its own pot all to itself and doesn't want to be around anyone else. And we find that they grow much better in, in their own pots. So if we can just come back to me, finish that slide, and I just wanted to physically show you something else. I have a fridge in the house full of seed. So um, once we process seed, this is what, what, we, what we're doing with it. So it's very well labeled. We've mixed the seed in with a coir mix, and you can buy coir briquettes, and you just soak them in water. And then they, you know, squeeze that squeeze that coir. So it's just all the water's not drip is has, has been squeezed out of it as it were. It's not dry, but it's obviously not saturated. We mix the seed in there about 50-50, and then we put the seeds into Ziploc bags. We make sure it is damp. We make sure that it's slightly open, and then we stuff it in the fridge. And again, there are different periods of time for which we hold different species in, in, in the fridge. And then we have to check on these almost weekly just to make sure they're not going too dry, they're not too wet, um, the fridge is still working, so on and so forth. But I've probably got, got two undercounter fridges in my room at the moment because we don't have any electricity at site, um, full, of, full of tree seed. So um, if I get it wrong, we won't have any trees next week. So there's a bit of responsibility there. And, uh, and, and that is a very rush through us in terms of um, tree seeds and collecting and processing. Brilliant, thank you so much, Adam. I think the word that comes to mind listening to all that you've done is ingenuity. You've come up with so many fantastic solutions to the different challenges that you, you face, so absolutely fantastic. Um, so what I'd like to do now is invite um, people who've got any questions or any contributions they'd like to make. So if you could uh, sort of uh, raise your hand, um, if you'd like to join conversation, then that would be great. Um, I'm just gonna put these okay. back in the fridge. Okay, <laughs> we'll, let you, we'll let you go and do that. Okay, I'll, I'll attempt to call people in as I see hands go up. So um, I can see a hand from uh, Sandra. Uh, Sandra Tuck, if you'd like to unmute and uh, come on screen if you want to. Hello. Hi, Sandra. Hi. Um, yeah, it was just a sort of quick one. <laughs> the, um, the spindle seeds, um, you know, the little orange coating that goes around the kind of creamy white nuts. Um, mm -hmm. Should we have taken them off before we stratified? Because we've we've stratified a couple of thousand or something. We we're not doing nothing like the numbers that Adam is, but um, I think we've probably stratified a couple of thousand seeds. <coughs> Sorry. So um, I would say that that's that's going to be fine. It may just take that bit longer to germinate. 
because uh, again, this whole stripping things away is just trying to speed up that process. So we're just artificially interfering, if you will, with nature to try and speed up that germination process. Um, it is a tiny little waxy, very thin coating around around the, the nutty seed, as you say. And, and we, we're experimenting this year because we realize there is a lot of time involved in removing that. Historically, we've removed it. As we're playing the numbers game, we're trying to cut corners as well. So we, we're doing trials of both. And I, uh, our perception is they will still germinate, but they may just take a bit longer. Thank you. Um, Eugene, I can see your hand up. Hello, thank you very much, guys. Really good. Adam, I just wanted to check when you put the seeds in the bag in the fridge, um, how important is it, do you think, to, you know, when you take them out and check that they're damp or moist enough, etc., how important is it to not move them too much? Because when I'm doing that, I keep some of which I'm always a bit careful not to move them too much in case I, I break the, uh, the seed sort of thing, you know. And I wanted to know where you get the, the, the briquette material. Uh, is, is that okay? Yeah, for sure. So you when you when your seeds first go in, um, and as I say, we worked out periods, if you will, to keep certain species in the fridge. Um, and we are uh, at the moment putting a guide together, which which we're going to have out in March, which um, which people will be able to access. But it's when you first put them in, I wouldn't be too concerned because they've hardly done anything. But you're right; towards the end of that refrigeration period, some, particularly Rowan, it will start to um, germinate and will start to shove out that 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 first radical. And then you're right, you have to be mindful of that. So it's not so much lifting them and moving them, but it's more the agitation than once you actually go in. And if you start to see them germinating, then you're right, you, didn't, you do need to start to get them out. Rowan itself can sometimes germinate a bit like cress. So yes, yeah, if they start to germinate in the bag, that's when you've got to get them out. And, and the point then is really just to spread that medium over the top of a prepared seed tray and then, uh, and then just let nature to work its magic. Oh, I just remember, I forgot to remind people to uh, say which community tree nursery they're from or and whereabouts they're based. Eugene, do you want to just quickly let us know? Uh, yes, I'm from the Tree Musketeers, London. Oh, OK. Hey. <laughs> Great. Oh, and where we get the choir from as well. Um, oh, yeah. Have I, am I allowed to say that? It's not the BBC, is it? I can, you know. We get it from a place called London Grow. So it's a web, it's, it's an online shop and we purchased the briquettes from a thing called London London Grow um, and I think you can get a box of them 24 briquettes is uh, about 30 quid so and that will do a lot yeah I'll do a lot. great thanks okay the next hand I've got is from Nick hi Nick hi there um I was just curious how you guys are coping with biosecurity issues in terms of harvesting seeds uh, or saplings from woodlands and then transporting those to nurseries and uh, then growing them on at various sites uh, with the increasing prevalence of pests and diseases, uh, particularly down here in the southwest. I'm based in Cornwall. Um, yeah, just what approach you taken with that to remain on the correct side of legislation? Who do you want to answer that? Marcelo, do you want to answer that one? Well, for us, as you, as I was saying, what like sanitation of pots is one of the things that we concentrate on because if there is an outbreak of disease, then it's it, it to stop it spreading. Sanitation is really what we try and do. Um, in terms of collecting. I, I, I'm not as much collecting from woodlands as individual like specimens that I find in parks or like, like I've, with the council. I've, I even in Hackney I asked them on like where where is a good tree of this that I could get seed from, and they will give me locations of that. So the actual seed itself, I'm not so concerned about bringing disease because i'm not 
collecting them from the ground and, and collecting them in small quantities. Um, it's more the soil that I'm more um, wary of when, so like not mixing soils, not having, um, for example, water dripping from one pot onto another pot um and it's that's what i'm more wary of then instead than then disease coming from the seed if you get what i mean um and it's more and then if there is disease if we do notice anything then it's about quarantining it isolating it chucking it and and eradicating that possibility of it spreading as soon as possible um and it's about being on top of that so um but luckily we haven't in the past we had a lot of issues and that's and i think that was mainly our soil mix and then the trees getting stressed out therefore being more susceptible to disease um so i i'm more on the side of be clean and have good soil and any trees that look unhealthy get rid because one being precious over one tree that could be diseased it threatens all the rest of your trees pretty much okay and we, Thanks, we don't, Marcelo. Yeah, Sorry. we don't um, plant the only plant in hackney so we're not transporting um um trees very far in that sense of spreading disease uh, yeah i agree totally agree with all of that in terms of cleanliness in, in your tree nursery and good soil management and so forth the only uh, two additions to to that that I can make is because we're collecting native broadleaf tree seed, there are certain rules around that. And that you can get that information online. Um, and it's all to do with certain seeds. You have to give notification to the Forest Commission of your intention that you're going to collect them. And then when you're growing them on, um, you've got to tell them, you know, where the seed came from. And then if you were to keep give those trees to someone else or sell those trees, then you have to give a supplier notice. But there is, um, this, this system was set up uh, from sort of the 1970s and basically it's continued and not really evolved much since that time. And there are questions now about how significant, how, how, how effective that system is. And also if people are doing really small scale stuff and they're working locally, again, is, is all of that bureaucracy really necessary? For us, we do it and we have to go through those hoops because we, we're a nursery that's affiliated with the Woodland Trust. So those are expectations. But there is work going on in the commission uh, and with DEFRA to, to review that. And there's a shared outcomes project at the moment that DEFRA is running, which is linking with various community tree nurseries and, uh, around the country, looking at biosecurity and how we can have effective biosecurity without it being too onerous. On, on those people who wish to wish to grow trees. Um, but yes, cleanliness is next to godliness. Right, and that, that may be a subject that we can look at more of in a future event as well. I'd like to invite Emma to come in now. You have your hand up for a while. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, hi, hi. From, uh, the Sherwood Forest Trust, we're in um, Nottinghamshire. Um, we haven't we've got funding to do a community tree nursery. We haven't started doing it yet. We've got a big patch of grass right now. Um, the, the project predates me and there's a big uh, obsession would be a word for it to have a polytunnel on the site. Um, well, they like it to take about like quite a big polytunnel to take about half of the area. And I, I feel that because we're going to be growing native local trees that I'm not really sure we need a big polytunnel I think we need one for shelter and for doing like you know messing around with the seeds bashing holly seeds that kind of thing but um I'd just like to get some views on what we would use a polytunnel for uh with with the native trees basically um well I think you've seen with Marcello you know your polytunnel is pretty very useful for you uh, for us, this is the first year that we've had a polytunnel in 20 years. And part of that is because we've never had any um, sheltered space for working. So it does provide us with that, which is undoubtedly really important. Um, 
<coughs> also, it is aware you can bring those seedlings on a bit earlier and offer them good frost protection. And, and so that it is useful and beneficial for that reason too. Um, but I, I, yes, I couldn't say invest heavily in a polytunnel simply on the grounds that it will facilitate propagation because we've been doing it 20 years without a polytunnel. But equally, um, we also had one trustee who was exceptionally dedicated and for 13 years he started them all off in his house. So, you know, if you don't have people who are willing to fill their back bedroom up with seed trays, then you probably do need somewhere that's going to offer frost protection and the polytunnel will be the cheapest way to do that. Yeah, I agree. We have two polytunnels. One is to work in and the social tea tunnel and then the other one is just germination. But the reason why we need that is because, like, for example, the ginkgo, I don't think, would have germinated well without it. Um, and certain species we will bring into the polytunnel over winter because for their first few years, so like Caliteria or um, or the foxglove trees for the first year or so, they're really susceptible to frost. Um, so that's why it's necessary for us, but for native, yeah, I agree it's not. You can start without and, and use the money to invest in something else. Yeah, I mean, we definitely want one. I think the case is, the, the question is how big it should be. So I was thinking if it took up a quarter of the site rather than half of the site, that would be a lot more sensible. Uh, that's, <laughs> that sounds like a plan. Um, okay, I'm going to keep the keep the conversation going because we've got about three or four more people who've got their hands up. I'd like to ask another Adam, Adam Gretton, to come in now. Hey everyone, um, yeah. I'm the other Adam from More Trees. So um, yeah, stole the name. I, is yeah. that a different More oh, Trees though? Just to... I just need to get the glasses. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So we're we're More Trees for Bath and Northeast Somerset, and we, we've been planting trees for 13 years, but we've just been starting to grow ourselves and our plan is to set up a, a network of nurseries in, in and around Bath. Um, yeah, and I just had a couple of questions. Um, one might be quite a quick answer, so hopefully I'll get away with asking two questions. The walking sticks in your picture, Adam, is that for pulling branches down yeah. towards you? Or? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I also found them quite useful physically for me this year, to be fair, I've been walking yeah. miles through the countryside. <laughs> But yeah, principally exactly that. We've also got what I call the Gandalf stick, which is a really long one, so you can get really high branches. Brilliant. Uh, cool. And the other thing um, is from your, your session as well, Adam, is the germination rates. I was, I was a bit alarmed when you said you collected half a million trees and you're kind of predicting 30 or 40,000. Um, is, is, is that right? Would you expect less than 10%? I mean, I know there's so many variables, but... Yeah, it ju just depends. Rome, we, there's a high percentage, so you might get, we might be getting 60%, 70% for Rome. Hazel, we could be in single figures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Spindle, maybe around 20 30%. So it's re it really is hugely variable. But the other thing, again, is we've collected a lot this year because we've decided to try different techniques. So we've had what you would perhaps call traditional techniques, which we know has always worked, but we're also trying to speed up processes, cut corners, work with different mediums, and so on and so forth. So we've collected more again because we we experimenting. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. I was going to invite Cara in next, but I noticed she was walking around with her laptop, so I don't know if she's still wanting to jump in now. Hey, there you go. Hi, Cara. Right here. Sorry. Um, Hi, yeah, great to hear everybody. Um, and I'd love to know who's in Wales, actually. I work for uh, Schleiser Goidweg, which is the um, Community Woodland Groups Association in Wales. Um, so I just would like to sort of say an offer and ask a question, if that's all right. Um, we've got, uh, I don't know if you can see that, but that's our little leaflet with the logo. Um, we, I don't know if people have worked with us before, but we, our, we support community woodland groups all over Wales, um, running into sort of a thousand hectares or so of woodlands, and um, got over a hundred woodland groups that we support. And we are at the moment doing um, strategic support 
on uh, developing community tree nurseries. Uh, we've got a couple, well, Coidenbach is actually one of our members. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we've been working with the Woodland Trust, uh, um, given out kit to 10 different groups who are gonna develop tree nurseries, hopefully. Um, so if, you, if there are uh, community nurseries or small nurseries in Wales, or wannabe ones, then please get in touch. I'll put my details in the chat. Um, and we'll be developing more work next year and hopefully getting funding and, you know, having a rolling programme. And we're looking at maybe trying to support consortiums of little nurseries to go for larger, you know, um, larger purchases from, from, you know, from the bigger organisations like Woodland Trust so that we can supply them. Um, if one little nursery can't do it, maybe five nurseries in the vicinity could do it. So we're looking at things like that as well um, to join people up strategically. Um, so yeah, get in touch, join us on Facebook um, and look at our website as well. I'll put that in the chat. My question was, it was really interesting to hear the city London perspective as well as the rural one which is more like what we're used to. Lo was saying about um, different international species as possible because that's kind of opposite of what, what we do. We're all about local provenance and don't move trees around and uh, you know because of disease and because we're trying to repopulate and mimic uh, natural woodlands I suppose. In that's our that's our sort of aims, but I just want is that I can I can see the good side of both importing problems, which could you don't know if it's a problem until many years in the future. I'm not criticising. I'm just genuinely sort of interested as to is that a concern or you know what. Sorry. I missed what some of the question. Is it a concern about, of disease uh, or um, in, in your organisation, Marcelo? Sorry. So you're breaking up a bit, Carl. Did you hear I what I said? Sorry. Not I think I, sorry. I, I got it. I think it was about how do you know in the long a term concern that about you're not going to be importing diseases, like over the longer term. I think. Well, so this is why we we've signed up with DEFRA to get a um, peach, it's called the peach system to get a phytosanitary um, certificates for all of these seeds that we're going to import. But it's like, we, we can't, in the city of London, it's not a natural environment. Therefore, um, native trees do not thrive. Rowan's Start, like do not establish well silver birch does not establish well um we have to look at alternatives and the only way to get these seeds is or the best way to get these seeds is from where they're from um so that's why we're looking to, to make connections with other nurseries and import seeds because um so i was just saying this one in greece they they just grow oak they just grow mediterranean oak um and the like last year was really good for exotic seeds because we had a really long season hot um whereas this year it's been a lot more difficult to find good viable exotic seeds so therefore we could have a few years that we won't have good viable exotic seeds and are we going to be able to produce the trees that we want um, and the only other alternative is to um, to get them elsewhere. Um, and it's, yeah, it's going, it's a lot better in terms of disease to import seeds than plants. Um, so that's why we would way prefer to import seeds than plants. Also it's cheaper. Um, we learn more by germinating them. Um, and over time, the climate in London is going to be a lot more Mediterranean. So, for example, in a street in Hackney, there's a there's um, one. This is one street in Hackney. There's it's a pineapple something. 
can't remember what it's called right now. It's a Brazilian tree that technically shouldn't live, be able to survive a winter in the UK, but because it's in such a um, heat island effect and in like a really um, narrow street, it, it lives and it's actually flowered this year and um, well, no, it flowered last year and it produces seed. <laughs> so we we literally like there are certain parts of london that we can plant natives but in um other parks and also we're looking to add diversity and beautify these parks so we want different more interesting trees so like for example um black walnut is one that i want to get growing um as I was saying, the Malus Turingos are really good little ornamental um, um, apple trees. Um, like Ginkgo does really well in the city now. Um, and all of these are really, if, if we're just relying on collecting in London, then not, we're not going to be able to get the species that we really want to supply. Um, therefore, we have to sort of think about how else to get them right okay Thank, thanks thanks Marcelo. i'm conscious of time we're kind of a few minutes over but i want to go to andrew next i've got a couple more andrew and then it's going to be christopher we've got the hands on so oh is that me yes yeah hi. that's you hi andrew. Uh, hi and hi it's andy uh on the isle of mile in scotland we've got a, a community a new community tree nursery here uh, and I've got my own independent little setup, been growing trees for a few years. It's a question for, for Adam about oaks. Um, we're growing oaks in, in root trainers like you, at the 175cc 32 cells a tray. I don't know whether you're growing them in, in bigger trays than that, but uh, my question was, do you grade your acorns into different sizes and then put or small acorns in what no okay and then do you have a problem with with acorns with trees out competing each other within the tray so you get larger trees shading out smaller trees and very uneven growth and then a lot of um empty cells in the trays um so we use maxes for everything you used to, uh, they're the they're the bigger ones yeah. yeah they do do one even bigger than that but we use the, what's called the maxi root trainers um and okay we definitely do get size differentiation and uh, and, and equally we, we get losses as well so where you get 40 maxes in a tray you, you know we um ideally would like to see 40 trays so there is some sorting that we do do so once these things are sort of become established and the compost that in there has an effective root system that's binding it, you can open them up yeah. and take out and put back to, to, together. So you, you can you could resize yeah. them. Depends how many you're doing and how intensive that is. Or quite simply, you just accept that some are bigger and some are smaller and you plant out the bigger ones. So if your bigger ones, say they've reached what we call the 2040, which is 20, between 20 centimeters and four centimeters, 40 centimeters high, and they have the right root collar diameter, which we get that spec from the British nursery uh, specification, the BS standards, then that will go out to planting. So we can supply that, it meets the British nursery standard, we'll supply that. And then the others, there'll be, there'll be um, at the end of say a winter period, because they're all dormant, all those have gone out, then we could have a day where we're consolidating. So we will basically yeah. repack yeah. them. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, what, and what percentage germination do you get in the trays out of a tray of 40? Well, when, we get the, uh, when we have the oaks and when we, because oak is the only one that we direct sow into root trainers. And because mm. they put out that radical, I would say we're really high really high like 90 plus percent because we've selected the acorn and and, and chosen it and it's shown that it's viable and we've then planted yeah it. um but if we were to just put acorns in mm. all the root that we just physically picked off the forest floor and just put one in each one then that could drop quite significantly because we wouldn't know if that seed was viable at that time 
So it's it's about the process for us. You know, we collect the acorns, we put them in the bucket, we've got the leaf mulch, we um agitating them gently, you know, to make sure that they don't spit and rot. And then and then as they put out that radical, we pick it out, we pot it. So you know, we we we're selecting at that point. Okay, thank thank you, Adam. And can we finally mm -hmm. go to Christopher? Hi, Christopher. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah excellent. Uh, yeah, my name is Christopher. Uh, I'm an ecologist uh, based up in, in Scotland. I uh, run a community group, uh, or we run a community group, should I say. also manage a couple of ancient uh, woodlands as well. Um, and just basically I had a question for, for the guys. Um, uh, basically in okay. regards to... Can you hear me okay? We're getting a bit of an echo and feedback. Okay, is that any better now? Yeah, that sounded better. Try, try again. Have another go. Right. Okay. Um, so basically, I had a, a question for a couple of the guys um, that were speaking earlier. If, if they had any experience, um, I've been collecting juniper because um, it's nearly locally extinct uh, in this area. So I've been collecting um, berries for a number of years. But I was just wondering if they had any experience actually taking juniper cuttings. Um, if that was something they had done and had any experience with? Unfortunately, no, no, unfortunately not. Again, sadly not. My only affiliation with Juniper is gin. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody <laughs> else? Okay. But if you do fight, if you do get success, let us know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got a couple of things I want to experiment with. Obviously, um, get decent results from, from the berries, but um, it was just especially through work but sometimes you find some juniper and you're like right i wish i could just take some cuttings of that you know um i mean the only know. thing we found with cuttings is experimentation so taking them at different seasons but also with the cuttings what we've been doing is we've been purpose building a cold frame as well and then so so they're sitting within a fairly um a static environments so they're yeah. not having cold or heat shock you know? okay yeah and, yeah and that's where we found and we've done that with hazel and with holly so you know we yeah. don't have juniper down here um and it's not something we eat but so that's that's where we found success is maintaining the um the environment that they're starting to establish in and i don't yeah. know if you use root gel uh rooting gels or things like that on your cuttings Maybe. Yeah, I've used that before. Um, I've got what have I used? I've used Clonex and a few different ones. Um, I've only ever used the gel. Um, I, I mean, is that I've never tried the powder. Is 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 the gel better? Would you say? I, or I couldn't. I couldn't say to be honest with you. Yeah, I would not say we've got enough extensive experience to say one's better than the other. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sounds, sounds like you're the juniper pioneer, Christopher. So. <laughs> <laughs> let us know how that goes so um yeah yeah please um continue this conversation on our facebook group which i mentioned at the beginning we've set up a facebook group uh the community tree nursery collaborative so if you're on facebook you can um ask to join the group and please carry on the conversation there and you know ask each other questions and answer and that's what the group's for it's your group um to use and, and share information um, as well, <clears throat> as much as you'd like to do. Um, we've also got a bit of news. Um, we've been successful in applying for a grant to the National Lottery. They've set up a new fund called Together for Our Planet, um, which is giving sort of small grants up to 10,000 for initiatives that build sort of community resilience to climate change. And we've been successful in getting a, a small grant from them for the Community Tree Nursery Collaborative. So that's going to enable us to employ a part time events and networking coordinator going forward. So we'll be advertising that job in the next day or two. So you'll see it on our social media and um, environment jobs. So if you happen to know of anyone who might be interested in being uh, coming to do that job and also being our first employee with the Fellowship of the Trees, that would be uh, fantastic. Um, it also means, as well as continuing to do these events, we'll also be able to 
um, organise some site visits. Um, and I know that Adam's already kindly offered uh, to host a site visit at Moor Tree, so we'll hopefully be able to do a couple of uh, um, site visits in sort of late spring, early summertime um, as well, so people can actually get to see tree nurseries in, in action on the ground, which is really the best way. I mean, these, these events are fantastic as well because it means people can join from, well, all across the world, really, but all across the UK and, and share stories. So hopefully we can, we can get those site visits up and running. And also, if you've got any other ideas of what we can be doing um, to help you, to support you, um, you know, to encourage you to, to share learning and to share knowledge, then, then please get in touch and, and let us know um, what we can do. And uh, finally, just to say that our next session is going to be on the 25th of January. So we got, we're sticking with Tuesdays because they seem to be OK with lots of people. Um, we had over 50 people join us today, maybe some more on Facebook Live. So the Facebook group, again, it's called Community Tree Nursery Collaborative. Um, I think Dion was asking. There you go, Dion. Um, and so it's Tuesday, the 25th of January. We're going to be looking at bare root techniques, all different kind of bare root techniques. It's the next one. And we, again, we've got maybe a subject for the third one, but if if there's anything you'd like us to cover in one of these events, or if you'd like to present something, that would also be brilliant. If you'd like to share um, your, your experience and knowledge, then, then please let us know and make a suggestion for, for a future event. That would, be, that would be great as well. So I'd like to give a huge thank you to Adam and Marcelo for, for sharing all their learning and knowledge with us this evening. So. Thanks very much, guys. And um, yeah, we look forward to hearing from, from more Community Tree Nursery members at the, at the next event in, uh, in January. And uh, thanks very much for, for joining us um, this evening. So and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for hosting, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.